Please be seated, ladies and gentlemen. And good morning to everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for coming back, first and foremost. That's the most important thing. We do appreciate that. And seriously, thanks for your cooperation and your dedication to duty, and I mean that also. So with that, did everything go smoothly last night? Anybody have any problems? Anything come up? Okay. Thank you all very much. All the admonitions were gone by? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to proceed uh, then with the presentation of the state's case. The next witness is going to be called, you're going to hear testimony by what is termed a deposition, okay? A deposition is a method of preserving testimony from a witness who cannot appear in person in court for whatever reason. The testimony of a witness who testifies by way of deposition should be judged as to the credibility using the same test and in the same manner that you would use to judge credibility as if that person was here in court testifying in person, okay? With that, state ready to call your next witness? Okay. All right. Um, go. And you need to hear it. If you can't hear it, just let us know. We can back it up to whatever you need to do. It may start off a little loud, too loud, or too low. Uh, uh, Miss Kreider here is an expert, and she'll adjust it accordingly. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't. Restart it? Okay, yeah, that's fine. Here's some reporting. Good morning. The time on record is 9 49 a.m. Today is September 23rd, 2009. My name is Abel Sabrell. Here's from reporting video, Emily Gates and Services. The court for today's bridge of Master Batista. Here's from reporting. Located at 530 B Street, Street 350, San Diego, California, 92101. This begins the videotape deposition of Gary Wellison, testifying from writer of the state of Ohio versus Anthony Kirkland. Taking a piece from Portland in San Diego, California. The video and audio recordings will take place at all times during this deposition, unless all counsel agree to walk the record. The beginning and end of each video tape will be announced. Will counsel, please identify yourselves and state who you represent. Mark Pete Murray for the state of Ohio. Norman Aubin for Anthony Kirkland. Thank you. The court will not swear the witness. Would you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Tell us your name, please. My name is Gary Rollison. Spell your last name, Gary, if you could. Sure. R-O-L-I-S-O-N. How are you employed? I am a professor at California State University, San Marcos. What type of uh, subjects do you teach, Mr. I'm a sociologist. How long have you been so employed? At uh, Cal State, uh, 13 years now. And prior to that, how were you employed? I was a professor at Arizona State University uh, for three years, three years prior to University of Oklahoma, and four years prior at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Are you currently married? Yes, I am. Do you have any children? Yes, I do. How many children did you have? I had two children. Uh, a son and a daughter? Correct. And I uh, understand the purpose we're here today is about your daughter, Kemia, is that correct? That's correct. When was Kemia born? She was born October 21st, 1981. And could you give us her full name and also spell her name for the benefit of the court reporter? Sure. Kemia, K-I-M-Y-A, I-M-A-Y-A, I-A-M-A-Y-A, dash, Bodhi, B-O-D-I, Corinne, Corinne, C-O-R-I-N-N-E, Wallison, R-O-L-I-S-O-N. And are those various family names that you incorporated into her name? Yes, they are. The uh, uh, Iamea is for her maternal grandmother. Corrine is her paternal grandmother. And uh, 
Bodhi is a nickname for a deceased brother, uh, brother-in-law, I'm sorry. And I, I spoke to you a little bit earlier this morning and told you we really can't go into a lot of her background, but if you could just describe a little bit about what type of child she was growing up. Well, she was a very bright child. She was very much uh, outgoing, fun-loving, if you will. Um, and as I had occasion to mention to you, um, she was ever, well, I don't know if I had a chance to tell you, but she was ever uh always engaged, um, <laughs> a bit messy. Okay. And her mother, did her mother have some uh, mental health issues? Yeah, in 1986, her mother uh, was diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenic. And was Kenya living, living with her at the time? Yes, she was living, yes. Did that affect Kenya? Yes. In what way? Well, part of it is the bonding. She was extremely close to her mother. And uh, it was hard for her to understand the, 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 the strange behaviors. And has uh, her mother since passed? Yes, she, she has. Did Kenya develop some problems uh, herself after that, the experience with her mother, with her mother's mental health issues and her mother passing? Well, she became a little bit uh, more rebellious, somewhat uh, withdrawn, um, and not she, she wasn't quite as happy-go-lucky as I described her as being earlier. Did Kimi at some point marry? Yes, she did. And was that a young man from Cincinnati, Ohio? Yes, he was. I believe his name was Anthony Davis. Correct. Did Kimi have any children? Yes, she did. And how many? Two children. How was the relationship with this Anthony Davis? Was that a healthy relationship or a somewhat violent relationship? I would characterize it as somewhat violent and unhealthy. At some point in time, did Kenya actually, she was living in California and then moved back to Cincinnati or moved to Cincinnati with this Anthony Davis? She moved with uh, Anthony Davis after they were married to Cincinnati. She had grown up here in San Diego. And approximately when was it that she had moved to Cincinnati? 2002. After that, did she come back and did she, if you could kind of describe her travels from that point on, she was married in California, mm -hmm. and then in 2002 is when she moved to Cincinnati? Right. And then what happened after that, sir? Well, she did come home to visit, I believe, in December of 2004 for the holidays, uh, and she went back. Uh, and uh, we didn't see her again here in San Diego until the end of May 2005. But before that, uh, we had made a trip uh, to Cincinnati. Did both her and her husband, Anthony, develop any type of problem during this time? Two problems. One, uh, the violence that you mentioned earlier, and the second, uh, drug addiction. Did she attempt to get help for that? Yes, she did. How was that? We thought, we being myself and my wife, we thought it was successful. Uh, however, we've come to find out it, it wasn't. If you could describe that, sir. Uh, she spent 60 days in rehab. Where was that? That was in Cincinnati. When was that? That would be in 2005. Two, okay. okay, you're correcting yourself, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm correcting myself, okay. 2006. I believe that was towards August, September, October, that time frame. Yes. What about her husband, Anthony, at that point in time? Was he also in the picture still, or I believe something may have happened to him just prior to that? Yes, before, uh, while Kimi was here in San Diego, uh, Anthony, uh, her husband, was arrested for robbery and sent to prison here in California. And I believe that was, so they had been back and forth between Cincinnati and California, and I believe they actually were back in San Diego uh, in the early part of the summer of 2006? Yeah, she came uh, at the end of May. And while they were back here, her husband at the time, Anthony, uh, got involved in a robbery and actually was arrested, convicted, and sent to prison for that. Correct. So he was out of the picture as of, I believe it would have been June of 2006? Correct. And it was after that that Kimi returned to Cincinnati to enter some type of drug rehabilitation program. Correct. I believe Anthony stayed in prison until actually this year sometime, 2009? That's also correct. But during that time frame, she had gone back to Cincinnati, entered this program. Did you 
at this time frame when she's back in Cincinnati in this program lose contact with her? Yes, I did. If you could describe towards the end of 2006 the contact you or other people in your family had with Kenya. Yes. Uh, well, we knew she was out of uh, rehab, and that was in late 2000. Well, actually, it was in October of 2006. Um, our last contact with her is that she was going to go to a halfway house after her treatment, and um, and that was pretty much that was pretty much it. When was the last time anybody in your family had contact with your daughter? That would be again in late October. Did you make attempts after that to get a hold of her and to try to find her? Yes. Can you describe that, please? Yeah, we called the uh, uh, we called the drug rehabilitation place. We. Uh, contacted, she was on probation, we contacted her probation officer. In Cincinnati? In Cincinnati. And uh, we also contacted the police department. Did you attempt to file a missing report? Yes, I did. Were you, did you have problems doing that, Mr. Yes, Collins? I did. How was that? Um, we were told that she was an adult and therefore, uh, and to this day I'm still mystified by it, but uh, we were told therefore uh, they wouldn't take it. Uh, they did classify her something, uh, some other category, which I can't remember. And I believe, was it your sister-in-law that actually was able to finally convince them to accept a missing person report? That's correct, and that was uh, months later, actually. I believe in the spring of 2007? Correct. But the last you or anyone had heard from your daughter, Kimia, would have been in sometime in late October of 2006. That's correct. What was your next contact with anyone about your daughter? Well, I was... In... I don't think I lost trying to get in, in touch with, with uh, someone because uh, her husband had been from Cincinnati, so uh, we were trying to uh, contact some of his relatives best we could. Um, and by we, I mean... Uh, we, uh, my wife and I didn't have very much success, but one of our, uh, one of my ex-sister-in-laws seemed to have had some success. And we knew that uh, Keyshot, my grandson, was, uh, was uh, in the custody of a, of a friend. So we called and uh, basically tried to see if, if they knew where Kimia was. And you were unsuccessful, obviously. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't have any success with that. I believe it was earlier this year possibly in April of this year, 2009, that you got a call from someone with the Cincinnati Homicide Department? Yes, we did. What was the nature of that contact, and how did that affect you, sir? Well, they informed us that uh, some bones had been discovered, and they had a reason to suspect it was the, the remains of my daughter. And, uh, and we waited, and uh, after a while it was confirmed. And I believe that was through dental records? Yes, sir. Were you able to get those remains back? Yes, we eventually got them back. We had a memorial service this past May and, and was able to uh, bury her uh, remains with her mom in, uh, in June. I guess to some extent it was a relief to find out what had happened, but it, obviously it's not the way you wanted to find your daughter after no. those years. It was. If I can show you what's been marked for identification purposes, and we'll deem this deposition exhibit number one. Can you identify that, sir? It's my daughter. How old was she approximately when that was taken? <laughs> Actually, we didn't take that. Uh, she was about 20. And I take it that's the way you want to remember her? Well, uh, yeah. I, I actually prefer, yeah. Just go off the record, man. Off the record, times 10 away. No objection. Just one other thing, Mr. Rollison. I mean, you mentioned uh, Kimi had two children. I believe it's a son and a daughter. Correct. 
How are they now, and do you have contact with them? Yes, I have contact. We've, we've basically been raising her daughter, Camilla. And How old is she? She is now six. And uh, her uh, uh, brother is now in the custody of uh, her father's uh, mother. Uh, and he's being raised here. They're both here in San Diego. Do you have contact with both of them? I have more contact, well. Obviously with? With, uh, with Camilla. It's been a bit more difficult with uh, Keyshawn. But at least we do have contact. Obviously they know their mother is gone? Yes, they do. Thank you, sir. And again, we're sorry we have to put you through this and appreciate your cooperation. And I'm sorry for your loss, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you. No further questions? Uh, sir, we have no questions, but Mr. Welch and I were equally sorry about Thank your you. loss. Obviously, we you didn't have to go through this. Thank you. No questions. Okay. The Saints failed to take that position. Gary Wallace and failed to take number one, which they said September 23, 2009. And the Saints failed to take that can stand up anytime you like. It's great. I'm sorry. You ready? Okay, thank you. the record the time is 7.52 a.m. The date is June 8, 2018. This is the beginning of the deposition of Lisa Kinney. The case caption the State of Ohio versus Anthony Kirkland. Will counsel introduce yourselves and state who you represent? Timothy Kutcher, C-U-T-C-H-E-R, attorney for Mr. Kirkland. Rich Wendell, attorney as well for Mr. Kirkland. Uh, Joseph Dieters, Hamilton County prosecutor representing the state of Ohio. And Mark Peekmeyer, Assistant Hamilton County Prosecutor representing the state of Ohio. The court reporter will now swear in the witness. Ms. Kennedy, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth of the witness? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. If I can announce your seat. Also swear you just because sometimes people in Ohio will say you need an Ohio notary to swear you in, so I'll do the same for Lisa. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. Thank you. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning. Lisa, will you uh, state your name and spell your full name for the court reporter? Um, Lisa Siders Kenny, L I S A S I D E R S K E N N E Y. Lisa. Where, where is your current residence? Um, do I give my full address? or uh, Green Bank, Washington, Whidbey Island. Okay. And are you married? I am married. And who are you married to? I'm married to Tom Kenny, Esme's father. And you had one child with Tom? One child. And when you say Esme, you're talking about Esme Kenny. Esme Kenny, yes. 
How old was Esme on March 7th of 2009? She had just turned 13. When was her birthday? January 20th. And on March 7th, 2009, where did you live then with Tom? Um, we lived at 5902 Winton Ridge Lane in Cincinnati, Ohio. And who lived in that residence? Um, Tom, my husband Tom, myself, and Esme. And we're going to show you what has been marked as State's Exhibit 3A. Yeah, that's my house right there. And on March 7, 2009, um, do you remember the weather that day? It was a beautiful spring day. It was the first one that we had had. About the mid-60s? Yeah. And what were you doing that day? Um, I, it was a Saturday. I got up and went to the YMCA with my good friend Denise, and we hit balls and um, went to a yoga class. And, and then when I came home, um, it would have been a little bit after noon or something, um, we were renovating our kitchen. Um, and the drywall guys had just been there, and they had um, just left a big mess, especially in the front entry, which had um, wood floors, and there was drywall dust all in the wood floors, and I um, uh, started cleaning that at some point. So your kitchen was being renovated, and, and on that day, after the YMCA, you went back to clean the floors. Mm -hmm. Was Esme there then? She was there. She had gone with her dad to her guitar lesson that morning and they would stop at the grocery store and bought me a big bouquet of yellow roses for some reason. So that was very nice. And um, Tom uh, had a couple of children from a previous marriage, is that correct? He has three older kids, yeah. And his stepson, Brian, was he there that day? Tom's son, Brian, was there that day. He was visiting from Boston, as was my brother was visiting from Oregon. And at some point, was it Brian who went to the University of Cincinnati basketball game? No, that was my brother. He met up okay. with some friends and went to the UC game. And what did Tom do with Brian? Tom and Brian split off after lunch and went up to Bass Pro Shop to um, look for some mud boots for Brian, who was starting a job um, at a farm north of Boston. So this is uh, early afternoon. They go off to the store. Mm -hmm. You're scrubbing the floors, and yeah. Esme is there. Mm -hmm. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what kind of child Esme was? She was a total joy. Um, just had a bubbly personality and um, loved people, just excited to be alive. She um, was a seventh grader at um, the School for Performing Arts in Cincinnati, where she played cello, and she also took guitar and um, was in the choir there. Now she was 13 years of age, as you testify, correct? Yeah. And um, is, you're well aware as a mother, kids mature differently. How, what kind of maturity level would you call, say, that Esme had? Well, she was the baby of the family, so she I don't know, it was almost like she was nine. She, she still would come in in the morning and sleep with me. And she, we drove her to school every day um, and picked her up. And just a family girl. And uh, what was Esme, what did she want you to do that day? 
Um, she was excited. She wanted to go running. The weather was it's just gorgeous. Um, uh, she was trying to get me to go running around the water reservoir because my brother had gone running there the day before. And she had actually gone over there that morning and um, thrown a baseball with, um, with her brother, Brian. Lisa, I'm going to give you states and get a 3A again, and if you would identify that reservoir for the jury. Uh, here's the water reservoir directly across from our house. But it had a big open field here. I mean, that's where we used to go sledding because there's a hill um, right there. And what was she wearing that day? She was wearing a crew neck shirt, um, you know, short sleeve, and um, these. Um, long silver athletic pants that had um, white stripes up the side and she was wearing a gray hooded sweatshirt from um, water of the gods which is a place near my dad's house in montana and um when she was i was cleaning but she was like let's let's go for a run you know she's just full of energy she was really excited because she was it had been her sister's, Franny's birthday the day before, and she was excited to Skype with them. Um, That's a, a video transmission between computers. Yeah, she was excited to have a, uh, a, a meeting with them and, and get to talk to, and she has two little nieces. I think they were probably two and four. No, they were a little bit younger than that. Sony was, anyway. Um, she was just really excited about that, so she she just had a, all this anxiety, and the weather was great. She was like, let's go for a run, and I'm like, I need, I just want to get this drywall dust out of the floor. I wanted to get it up. It was, yeah, anyway, it was driving me nuts, and it wasn't very safe. <laughs> and did you, in, in your discussion with Esme, um, did she describe how she, did you tell her where she's allowed to run and things like that? Yeah, I said, well, to me it was a big deal. It was the first time she'd ever done anything by herself. You know, I said, well, I just thought, go blow off some energy, just like go across, just run around one time around the reservoir and come right back. Because I thought that would buy her time before her sister, um, you know, called back. But you had decided to go back to cleaning, correct? Yeah, well, I wanted to get it done. I was like halfway finished and I just... You know, I would have put her to work, but it's drywall dust. It's not something you want a kid touching. You know, otherwise that would have been a great activity for us to do together. But what was the last thing um, Esme said to you before she went on jog? She was super excited to be doing this thing. You know, independently. But, you know, it was a big deal. She wondered whether she should wear a sweatshirt, and she ended up. I'm like, well, you're going to get hot as soon as you run. So she ended up taking her sweatshirt off, so then she was just down to her crew neck shirt, and then she said, um, if Franny calls while I'm gone, tell her, tell her I'll be right back. And this was a little bit before 4 p.m.? Yeah, somewhere around there. Will you describe to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what occurred next? So I... Um, started to scrub on the floor again and just got lost in that and then i all of a sudden sat up and went oh my god as is not back i didn't know how much time had passed but it was like she should have you know it's i think it's maybe a half a mile all the way around um i just knew something was wrong i just and i you know, I was actually still just in my yoga clothes and no shoes on. I just went right across the street. No socks? No socks. No. I mean, I was barefoot. I just, I just had that feeling. Was you, like, oh my God. The, um, the, uh, your driveway, is it paved? Oh uh, yeah, it was paved, but kind of gravelly. And the road itself? Was paved. And the path around the reservoir? It was just grass. Yeah, there was no real. There was some concre a concrete drive up to it for, I don't even know what that building's used for, but anyway. 
but that only went up maybe 100 feet. And then, and then the rest of that south side, it, it became grass everywhere else around. Well, I'm going to give you this uh, exhibit back. Um, show us north and south and things okay. of that nature. So our house would be southeast of the reservoir. That would be the southeast corner. Southwest corner, north west corner and then northeast corner okay and where did you go when you first went across well i just went right out of the house and you know, then on the south side on the south side yeah and then i ran to this corner did you find something there yeah i mean right at that corner i i there's a tree and i saw this is the northeast corner no, northwest corner. I'm sorry. Okay, I got it. I went, nur, nur. So the northwest oh, sure. corner, I found a big pair of jeans under the tree with a mini blind cord in the waist. You want me to go back to yeah. where I was? Yeah. So I ran, started the house, and then I ran up to this corner. I want to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, the State's Exhibit 32V. Do you recognize that? Yeah, those are the pants I found, and that's the mini blind cord, which is, anyway, that was just alarming. It said to me somebody that couldn't have a belt. And what happened next? Okay, and then, so then I look down the north side of the reservoir, and I see a bag lying on the ground. Yeah, so now I have a straight shot this way. I didn't know it was a bag. I saw this form, and I thought it might have been her collapsed. So it wasn't very, maybe 15 feet or something. I ran right to that. It turned out to be like a grocery, one of those plastic grocery handle bags. That was exhibit 3D. What do you want me to do about it? Just wait Point at it? The number of it, yes, 3D. Okay. We're just so the court reporter knows what exhibit. You oh, have for her. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So, did you run home after that? No. Um, I found this bag with stuffed with more clothes and a bottle of beer in the center of it, and. I just felt like something was wrong. And then, so I run the length of the building. On the corner of the, the northeast corner, I found a case of beer um, up against the, the wall. And then I went straight home um, and searched the house. I just ran around the house real quick. And then I called my husband, Tom and said, Esme's missing. And he said, okay, I'll come right home. And then I called 911. And that was at 4.21 p.m.? Yeah. Did you return back to that area? Yeah, I immediately went back across the street to look for her. So I went around the side, the, I went around the reservoir again. By that time, the bag was missing the bag with clothes and the bottle of beer. And I just was thinking uh, that she was abducted. <laughs> it, finding the clothes as uh, somebody was there on her path. And so I thought about where they might be. And so north of the reservoir started another triangle of woods before you get up back up to the intersection of roads. And I, it, it was very thick. I was trying to find, I thought if somebody grabbed her, they probably would have gone in those woods. Yeah, here's a, a and it was just really dense and tangly, full of honeysuckle. And so at a certain point, I just like went through the honeysuckle and I had to like crawl. I couldn't even stand up for, for quite a ways. I want to hand you what's been marked for identification of State's Exhibit 42B. Does that accurately depict the underbrush that you yeah, caught through? Yeah, honeysuckle, yes. And I kind of got to the center of that area. It was more cleared out. Um, 
and I just stood and listened and tried to, I didn't see anything. It turns out I was very close to where they found her body. But I thought about a house that was in our neighborhood that was foreclosed on. Lisa, before, so you, get, before you get to that, this is, um, okay. this is the north end of the reservoir, uh, States Exhibit 3H. Are those the woods you went into? Yeah. And here's kind of the clearing I was in, where it's thinner. You can see that. And the house I end up going into. Right there. Is that an abandoned house? Um, well, yeah, I had the sense that it was foreclosed on. Um, it must just, yeah, it must, must have had like a realtor sign saying foreclosure. That was 2008, so the end of the, 2009, so that was, you know, when the economy tanked in 2008. So, at any rate, I thought, oh my God, she, whoever has her is probably in that house with her. So I go up to the door, and actually before I entered the house, I called my brother, because um, Tom and Brian were already on their way back. So I called my brother, and also told him that Esme was missing, because this I had my, I had grabbed my cell phone when I had gone back to call 911, and I gave him the address of the house, and I said, I want you to know where I am in case I don't come out. And so I went in and I searched the house. The house was empty. I, did you just did you search the second? Was there a second floor? There was a that? second floor and a basement. It was one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life. But um, all I found was a sock. And then by the time I came out, um, I'm looking now south on the road, and um, I see my husband down there in the cop car. Had, pulled up. Um, the cop car did not go to my house. The cop car went to the where our mailboxes were um, down at the end of the water reservoir. Did you, is, well, there was a, a newly sold home too that you went to. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me think about when I went. When I had gone home to make the 911 call, not only did I search my own house in case she had come home ahead of me, um, but I ran out to our yard because we had a big pond back there and I was afraid she, maybe she drowned. And then I went to the house next door and kind of looked around, searched around there too. On three A's at newly sold That's house there. that one, so it would have been the neck, our next door to the, and you can see the pond on that too. Pond, and then our next door neighbor's house, yeah. And you went to search that neighbor's house, that was just. Right, and then I did that before I went back around the water reservoir, and then went into the woods, and then the foreclosed on house. Then and the then I met with the police. Then the police were there. The, by then the police were there, and, and Tom and Brian were home. What did they, um, 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 I said I wanted a name, that my daughter was abducted and, and I needed a name, call her, miss, you know, she was missing. And they, were, they asked for her name, they started taking, it was two young guys. Um, um, they took down her name and they asked her age and I said that she was 13 and they said, oh, well, she's a teenager. And I said, well, she's not a teenager like a teenager. <laughs> and I tried to explain that I had found clothing on her path. And they said, well, she's probably just up at McDonald's. Or did you try calling her friends? Did she have a boyfriend? They started like asking me questions like this. And I was like, I thought that I was telling them that she was abducted because I knew she was. How big, <laughs> how big, what was her height and weight, do you remember? She was pretty thin, maybe, I mean, she was like 110, and she was 5'6", um, I believe. No. How tall? 5'4". Five, 5'4". Four. Five, four. Oh. So at that point, so the police were treating this as a possible runaway, basically. Yeah, I guess. Um, they just didn't get it. <laughs> 
And then, then they wanted a picture of her. I ran in the house. Tom still stood and chatted with them. Um, I grabbed the picture of her off our piano. It was the prior school picture, but, and then I came back out to talk with them. And they were saying things like, maybe she's out of friends or, you know, let us know if she's not back by midnight. They just seemed very, <laughs> very convinced that she's a teenager and this is normal activity for a teenager. And I said, well, what about the beer? Like to me, having somebody dropped off beer for the person who was, that's why there was the beer in the clothing and somebody was up living in the woods and was on her path. I said, what about the clothes? What about the beer? Well, they walked up there and the clothes were gone. So obviously they didn't believe me that I had found them or some, I, you know, so that's the way we left it, is that the police said don't, or call us back if you don't um, hear from her by midnight. So, so Lisa, you then embarked on a, a mission to basically conduct your own search. Yeah, I went home and um, started calling my friends who, when I said Esme's missing, and I put it on Facebook that Esme was missing, Everybody, people that knew her just knew that that was wrong. And so um, I immediately had several other moms from her school show up. Um, my brother Corey was back and um, a couple of her friends, his friends, Tom, Brian, everybody was looking in the woods. Um, people were driving around. Um, we made flyers. Um, we had people that were actually drove the whole, um, what is it, 295? And whatever the interstate loop, and we're putting. 275. 275. It's been a while since I've been there. Um, putting them up in all the gas stations and stuff. I mean, I started thinking beyond the one specific person that might have abducted her near the woods. I mean, I thought, I thought, well, maybe she hadn't even crossed the street. Maybe somebody in a van had just grabbed her and she's already long gone. Anyway, so we just had people searching. Actually, they searched all night. Well, and you got a call from a, a neighbor, Eileen, at that point. Yeah. I called my friend Eileen that lived down in Wooden Shoe Hollow. And she said, well, did you call the policewoman that lives on our street? And I said, no, I didn't realize we had a policewoman. And she said, I'll, I'm going to give her a call. So my friend Eileen called um, Jenny Ernst, who, who lived also on Winton Ridge Lane, just down the road from me. Um, and she had just come on duty, I guess. Um, she was with a canine unit, maybe a Colerain, if I'm remembering right. And she had just come on duty and she said, okay, I'll go check it out. And so she and her partner um, drove over. They left their dogs in the car. And they, um, they walked around the reservoir and right where I had found the jeans, um, Anthony Kirkland was sitting under the tree. And um, I obviously wasn't there, but I, got a phone call from Jenny asking if Esme had, was wearing a watch and had an iPod with her. And I said, yes. Hey, excuse me to interrupt, Lisa, uh -huh. but um, you kept calling District 5. I did. I kept calling District 5. At one point, I even had one of my friends go down to District 5 and give them an her up to her new, um, what do you, I found a picture where she was wearing the same exact clothes and a current picture, I think it was within the month. So I wanted to give, they had had a picture that was about a year old. Um, and, and so when she went into District 5, she said, oh, I have a more recent picture of, of the girl that's missing. And they had no idea what she was talking about. 
Were you asked, to, did Jenny ask you to come up and identify some items? Yeah, so um, I don't even know what time it was. It was nighttime. I remember it being dark because they flashed, <clears throat> all the items were on the ground. There were hot dog buns and Esme's watch and I, I, uh, what do you call them? I, iPods. iPod. Sorry. Um, yeah, Short. they shined a flashlight on the ground and I could see her. Shortly after iPod and an watch. earlier legal proceeding, um, you asked to get her personal belongings back, is that correct? Yeah. Tim, are you familiar with this entry, the substitution? Yes. Okay. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for states, states exhibit 3E is an Edward. Yeah, that's her watch. She had just got that from her dad for Christmas. Well, that was one of the items you ID'd that night. Mm -hmm. uh, States Exhibit 3F. Yeah, and that's her iPod. State Exhibit 3G. Yeah, so I had given it to her for Christmas and had her name engraved on the back of it. At this point, even though you identify these items, you still didn't know what happened to Esme. No. They told me that they had a person of interest. Right. How did you learn they found Esme? I didn't find out until morning. But at least when I went back to my house, I felt like the police were now on the case. It wasn't just us looking. We went home and um, we didn't really sleep that night, but we had been lying down upstairs and I don't know what time it was. It was, it was um, the spring forward night, so I'm not entirely sure what time it is, but we got a phone call from my brother-in-law saying that they had called off the Amber Alert. Um, It was also a night just remembering like there were helicopters flying through the air. Oh, anyway, it's hard to sleep. Um, I still can't hear helicopters without, you know. Did you talk to uh, about it. the District 5 at that point? Um, well, actually, we turned on the TV and it said that the Amber Alert, Amber Alert was called off for Esme. I can't remember whether it said that she was found but we felt very hopeful. And so the first thing we did is my husband called Children's Hospital, thinking that maybe she was just hurt. Um, no, we hadn't been contacted by any, any of the police yet. We just found this out on our own from it, saying it on the TV that the Amber Alert was off. So then we called District 5 and they were like, oh, hasn't anybody called you yet? <laughs> and we're like, no, what, what's going on? And they said, well, oh, we'll have somebody call you. It took them several hours. We were, we're just waiting, you know, to be contacted by District 5 while they were figuring out, I guess, what they were, what they were gonna tell us. But a chaplain and a police officer came to our door very early morning and told us that Esme was dead. I want to hand you what's been marked for States Exhibit number 31. Can you identify that person? That's my daughter, Esme. No further questions. No questions, thank you. The time is 8.24 a.m. We're now off the record.
I really enjoy that, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you for your attention. Uh, we're going to take a short recess. It should be pretty short. They need to do some other things here real quick. Remember all the admonitions. We're moving along, okay? Forget about the case for a while. Don't read anything, do anything. Just take a break for a little bit. We'll get you back here, hopefully, hopefully, within 10 minutes, okay? Thank you very much. All right.